Hi, I'm Darren Pepper. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. All right, everybody, welcome into episode 128 of the Leaning into Leadership podcast. Uh, this special midweek edition, the third special edition, uh, the combination of myself, Dominic Armano, Todd Bloomer. We are here to talk March Madness, folks. Selection Sunday, right around the corner. The entire world, whether you're a college basketball fan or not, gets consumed by March Madness. But as a school leader, there's a whole different kind of March Madness that takes place. So we'll probably talk a little bit of March Madness hoops, but we're going to talk a little bit of March Madness as well. All the silliness that happens during the month of March, you've got assessments, you've got hiring season, you've got budget, you've got all kinds of goofy stuff. March seems to be the time of year when our employees do silly things that just consume our time. We've got athletics going crazy, all kinds of fun, fun things happening in the month of March. So with that, gentlemen, Great to see you. I'm excited about episode three. Todd, I'm going to come over to you first because there is no crazier place in March than the high school principal's office. Uh, uh, (laughs) Facts. Uh, Straight hashtag facts, Darren. Um, You know, good to see you guys. It's been a a busy six weeks. Um, I think I've worked six or seven Saturdays in a row. Um, And and the events that I'm working are bucket fillers. Uh, Yesterday, JROTC. Great community event. We were handed out prom dresses and suits to the community. Uh, baseball, uh, March Madness is at full effect. Uh, spring break is, is uh, when we drop this episode, we'll be on spring break, a much needed spring break. And then in the state of Texas, we got about two months uh, until we graduate. So we're uh, going to recharge for a week, and then we're going to come back and strap on the seatbelts and, and be ready to rock and roll. So I'm ready to jump in with you guys today on this, on this great day, and, and it's good to see you. All right. So uh, how's everyone doing? Um, again, just uh, excited to be here for episode three. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what to say. I mean, March, March is mad. I mean, we have I'm just thinking, uh, Darren, to your intro about the craziness and the things that are happening in the school and all the fun. I mean, just this week alone, I was dressed up as a Superman, uh, as dinosaur, as a dinosaur. Um, what else did we do? We've reco- oh, we had a uh, uh, Sable serving Sable volleyball tournament. Uh, so there was a, a video we published there and had a little fun with that. Um, we're heading into the month of PARP, P-A-R-P, which is a um, national PTA um, parents as reading partners. So it's a big reading initiative with a lot of activities that are happening through you know the month of March. Just, um, yeah, state tests, reorganization. Um, it's crazy. But at the end of it is that was... Um, summer months of june and july and everyone's just getting pretty excited to see this year kind of winding down so uh we'll see we'll see where march uh takes us yeah absolutely so you know i i, I began this month in uh in new york city uh, i was actually in times square speaking at uh, the innovative school summit conference uh there at the marriott marquee and you know number one being in times square for the first time was uh Let's just say it was pretty pretty spectacular. Um, I definitely enjoyed that. I know Don, you and I were texting while I was there. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, definitely a lot of fun. But uh, you know, as as we go into the month of March, you know, looking at that group of people, so two hundred or so current or aspiring school leaders, district leaders, in my room uh, for my session, leaning into school leadership. And man, to just see the look on their faces, to see the look in their eyes, right? Like it's that it's that start of March exhaustion, you know? Um, you know, Todd, you alluded to it a little bit just with, you know, it's been a heck of a six weeks. And uh, man, this time of year, I mean, every time of year, I think you can probably look at every time of year and say, man, this time of year. But when we get into springtime and, you know, the, you know, the, the flowers start to bloom a little bit and love is in the air in the hallways, especially at a high school and um, graduations right around the corner. And like like you guys were alluding to all those other things, it uh, it certainly can be a 
a crazy time, but it's also an energizing time, right? I mean, I always felt like, yeah. you know, man, it's March. Here we go. We're headed off to state basketball tournament. And yeah, we got state testing right around the corner and we've got this and we've got that. And man, now I get to start looking at my team, right? Like right now is that time. You know, I, I was in a couple of districts in the last uh, week or so. Both are offering like early notification bonuses, right? Like I'm not coming back next year. Here's an extra 500 bucks for letting us know in advance so we can go out and start shopping for new teachers or new administrators or whatever, right? And to me, that time of year of looking at your team, looking at your needs and looking at the people that are out there, trying to put their best foot forward to come be a part of one of your schools. To me, that's an exciting time of year. So um, we can go in so many different directions when we talk about March Madness, but but to me, March Madness, with all the other noise, man, it, it's, it's hiring season and it's time to start going to find those people, the, the new people that are gonna join Churchill High School as, as an example, right? So, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that, Todd. What what does that look like right now? I, I just I just dropped a blog um, when we were recording this. I just had dropped the blog a couple of days ago. Uh, when it's released, it's, it's a couple of weeks old. About getting the hiring process right and some of those those important pieces that go into it. So let's let's spend a little bit of time, guys. If you're okay with that, let's spend a little bit of time on that hiring process and on that energy that comes with going and finding those new members of your team. You know, um, hiring is now, I, I believe, uh, Dom, you can probably agree with this also, a, a 365 day a year um, endeavor. Um, gone are the days of, of posting a job in June, waiting for people to apply, and then uh, picking the best candidates. Um, we're in a teacher shortage, and teachers have choice now when it comes to where they work. Um, and what I found out of COVID was um, teachers don't want to commute anymore. And where we had teachers that were willing to drive 20, 30 miles, uh, sit in cars, 45 minutes to an hour, one way to get to work. I think COVID really uh, brought to the forefront them time with family. So I, we, we've lost a lot of teachers that used to commute to our school. And now we're having to re-recruit almost our area to say, come work in your neighborhood and come work, uh, you know, two miles down the road from your house and kind of go from there. So at Churchill High School, you know, we basically try to paint a narrative of a place where you want to work all throughout the year. We use social media. We brand our school as a place where teachers are valued and teachers are treated as professionals and teachers are treated as family. And when you come on board, you know, that's how you're, that's how you're treated. And, and if we start doing that in August, September, October, November, then people start to realize that. Any chance I get an opportunity to talk to my faculty, I talk to my faculty about you guys know what it takes to be a good Churchill Charger. Go out and find me people for positions that are opening up. So we generate the buzz throughout the entire year. And then my job as, as the principal, it's almost like you're a headhunter of a company and you have to be out there looking for those people. So when you go to a conference and you hear teachers speak or you meet somebody that you think would be a good addition, you can't be afraid to say, hey, look, I think I'm going to have an English opening this summer. If you're interested, I'd love to talk to you about that. And I don't think that's tampering with anybody. I think it's just seeing great quality and wanting to add them to your team. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's there's all fair and love and war. And, and when we go out to recruit teachers and bring them on board, we have to do everything we can to put the best teachers in front of the students. And so as we get into March now, we're going to get our allocations for next year this week. So we'll know what that looks like and that we'll know what we're uh, up against. And then we'll start that process of saying, OK, We've been thinking in our mind, we need this English teacher or this socialized teacher to add to our, our, our team to take it to that next level. Now let's go out and get that person. So it's an ongoing process throughout the whole year. And to be honest with you guys, it really excites me. I love going out there and finding the right fit for our campus. I don't do a lot of things well as a principal, but the thing I think I do really well is finding great people to add to our team. Well, I think, I think number one, you probably do a whole lot more than you give yourself credit for really, really well as a principal, you would, would still be in that role. But uh, I, I, I do think, um, and I could be wrong, but 
this is not the NFL. I don't think there's a tampering rule. I don't think there's anything that keeps you from from having those conversations and saying, man, I would love to have you on my team someday. And if I have the opportunity, let's gauge the interest, right? Um, Dom, I'm curious, uh, you know, obviously, we were talking about this before we hit the record button. You and Todd, just from an academic calendar standpoint, are at least a, a month, if not a month and a half apart in the yep. process. So so for for Todd right now in early mid March, he's well into that swing. You you can't sit back, right? Like you can't sit back and wait no. another month to compete, you know, to compete against, you know, schools in in Texas or uh, I'll tell a story here in just yeah. a minute. I, I want to have you respond here a little bit, but then I'm going to share a story with uh, a principal I had a conversation with recently in Las Vegas. One of our listeners, Tika Epstein, big shout out to Tika. Um, but we had a really interesting conversation about hiring and recruiting in, in Clark County. So go ahead, Dom. I'm just again, let's talk about that that six week lag in there. Yeah, so we are a our academic calendar for the kids, right, is September, usually after uh, Labor Day. So September 3rd, 4th, depending on the calendar. And then they run through about June 25th, 26th, 27th. Um, my calendar is usually August, the last two weeks of August. So you're looking at like August 16th, 17th through June 30th. Um, so we are, I guess, about a month you know, we are where Todd was last month. So as much as we're talking about reorganization and, you know, the conversations are getting started now, we're not 100% in it or ready to go. Um, you know, we are, it's a phase in, I say phase in, but it's a step-by-step -step process. So I think by April 15th or so, our board of our school board has to adopt the proposed budget by the district. Uh, and then once that gets adopted, then we'll kind of know what we're looking at in terms of staffing and placements, you know, um, teachers, uh, I think they've already, you know, submitted retirements to central office. So we do have an idea of, you know, each building has an idea of who's retiring. Um, so that kind of, you know, you start thinking about that. Um, but the other interesting thing is, um, you know, hiring sometimes happens throughout the year uh, and, and maybe not necessarily in teaching positions, but especially with support staff. You know, as needs change when it comes to like IEP mandates, one on one aides or power professionals or things like that, we're kind of constantly hiring. So like I find myself doing the interview process where like some people may be sitting down in April, May, June, and that might be like their bulk interview process. Um, I feel like I've been interviewing all year. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, we have not yet really seen the teacher shortage uh, impact the Long Island, New York area yet. Um, what I have seen, though, is a shortage impacting those support staff areas. So we've had a lot of issues, um, you know, kind of staffing those areas. But, you know, hiring is one of those things where I say I, I love to hate um, and I hate to love because I love interviewing people, right? I love seeing what's out there. I love getting to know people. Um, I also use interviewing as a way for me to learn because, again, there are some of these, you know, for lack of a better term, newbies, right, that are out there. Maybe they've just graduated. They're looking to find the job. You know, they're bringing their A game to the table when they're meeting with you. You know, the things that they bring up and they say or the initiatives that they share it just blows you away. Uh, but then you get into this, this, you know, the hate piece of it or the dislike of it because, you know, I find myself in situations where there's so many good candidates, I don't know who to choose. And like, I hate being in that situation where it's like, oh my, well, what do I do? Like, you're really, I, I would love to just, you know, hire them all or be able to ex expand. But, you know, it is one of those, those pieces that I just genuinely love. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm curious, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm, this is going to be the first time I'm hiring where I am. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just interesting, because I, I really, I've taken time this year to get to know the building. Uh, and now I'm just going to I'm excited to hopefully be able to create new matches and, and really, you know, make that, you know, perfect. So we'll see. Hey, Darren, can I jump in there real quick? I uh, Dom, one thing, um, state of Texas, I'll speak for the entire state. Uh, those candidates that you have multiple ones that you wish you could hire, uh, encourage them to move to Texas because we have plenty of openings. <laughs> you got it, Todd. <laughs> San Antonio. Churchill cluster is kind of what we need. I think one thing that also has really put a, a curveball in hiring 
um, now for us, and Dom, you spoke on it, is people used to retire at, at like semester or end of the year. And now we have people leaving the profession on a random Tuesday. Like they're not even given two weeks. Like people are, whether it be they're looking for another job that benefits their family, it could be a support staff or a teacher. We have people that are just saying, you know, I'm out and I'm going to leave today. And that makes challenge, that makes hiring so difficult because over the summer, you know, you're able to, to look at the talent pool of multiple districts. People can get out of contracts in a random Tuesday in November or March. People are under contract and that makes it difficult because now we're looking at long term subs. When you have a long term sub that affects classroom instruction for where you have. So that's another piece to the puzzle that I don't know how we're going to address it or how we're going to battle it. But people are and I, and I don't blame people for retirement or for stepping away or benefiting their family and going for a different job that makes two times that or gives flexibility or autonomy that public schools can't offer. But it is a challenge for a public school leader that has to ensure that a great teacher is in front of every kid. You know, it's it's interesting <clears throat> that uh, that you bring that up. Uh, you know, one of the things that for me has been really eye opening now in the work that I do is I always worked in systems that Todd you just described. You you hire them; they're there for the year. You know, they might tell you in November, "Hey, I'm leaving at the end of the year," uh, but usually they get hired, they stay. Now. I've worked with a number of districts this year, especially up in the Northeast where Dom is, and that's just not how it functions there. Uh, one district in particular, you know, a counselor, you know, notifies on a Monday, hey, here's my two week notice. And in the meantime, they're waiting on, you know, uh, the new counselor to come six weeks later after they've interviewed and, and hired that person. And, um, uh, well, within that same district, talking with one of the one of the principals, they just opened an assistant principal position, and they do believe that they'll fill it before the school year ends. That person will like actually come in and start in May. Um, so much different uh, in other parts of the country, where typically, you know, working in Arizona, Wyoming, and Colorado, when you sign that contract. If you attempt to leave the state or the district, rather, can request that the state rescind your license, where in, in other places, it's that's just commonplace. I mean, Dom, am I am I misstating that? Is that what you see up up in New York? Because I know in New Jersey, where, yeah. where this particular district, that's just yeah, really no. common practice. Yeah, I mean, you've hit the down on the head. I mean, especially, you know, I, and I, I don't know what it is, you know, and I feel like. I'm experiencing this probably for the first time in my career, you know, and, and I've been doing this for 16 years, but yeah, it's it, postings are happening all the time. Like just as we, you know, as being an administrator in New York, we get the postings and it's just interesting to see the openings that are just trickling in throughout the year, you know, uh, counselors, like you said, um, assistant principals, e even principals, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. And, and, you know, I'm wondering if it has something to do with, you know, a lot of schools received increased funding for COVID. Uh, and so maybe, you know, that money has an expiration date to it and they're constantly changing what you could use it for. So maybe as they're tweaking the grant, you know, um, mecha I don't even know, like I, I don't even know what I'm looking for, but as they're tweaking ways that you could spend the money, uh, maybe that's why positions are opening up. But people are are jumping and they're going and and whether it's to be closer to home or again like todd was saying before you know maybe because it's easier for your family but yeah i'm, I'm definitely seeing that a lot more now so than i've ever before yeah i just i, I think it's really interesting and um i, I want to tie that back to something that todd said and then also something that i alluded to earlier a conversation that i had uh, with tika epstein in las vegas a couple of weeks ago we sat and had a conversation about her school and about some of the positions that she'll be having come open, the, the number of positions that she'll have, which isn't a, a super huge number. I'm not going to say the number out loud because I don't want to jinx her and have that like double on her because um, it would totally be my fault. Um, but what we had talked about was how the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, so UNLV right there in town this year. 15 elementary education graduates, 15, one, five folks, one, 
five. Um, now, granted, it's a it's a university that has begun to move more and more and more into the medical um, medical field as a primary focus for for the entire campus. But to only have fifteen elementary ed graduates, um, I'll double down on that. in In the state of Wyoming, my home state, uh, having a conversation with an HR director at a district I worked at recently in Wyoming telling me the same concern from the University of Wyoming, a teacher school, honestly, a teacher school. And so so this is where I wanna tie that all together. Are you a school or district leader looking to unlock the full potential of your team? Do you dream of a cohesive, empowered staff all marching to the same beat? Well, then look no further. Introducing the ultimate solutions, high-performance leadership teams from Road to Awesome, our two-day leadership retreat designed exclusively for school and district leaders like you. And picture this, a tranquil setting, away from the hustle and bustle, away from the email, away from the phone calls and the constant interruptions. Over the course of two transformative days, you and your fellow leaders strategize, collaborate, and align your visions. You dive deep into discussions, workshops, and team building activities, all geared towards one common goal, unleashing the collective power of your leadership team. But this isn't just any retreat. It's a dynamic, hands-on experience crafted by experts in education and leadership development. You'll walk away with practical tools, actionable strategies, and a renewed sense of purpose to tackle any challenge that comes your way. Imagine the impact of having your entire leadership team on the same page, working effectively and efficiently towards a shared vision. With our retreat, that dream becomes a reality. So if you're ready to revolutionize your leadership approach, inspire your team, and drive real results in your school, don't miss out on this opportunity. Reach out now to start planning your two-day leadership retreat and take the first steps towards transforming your school for the better. Visit roadtoawesome.net or email me at darren at roadtoawesome.net to set up a free consultation and launch your team into a successful year. Your journey towards exceptional leadership, your journey on the road to awesome starts right here. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. You know, Todd, you mentioned some different ways to go about the recruiting process, that it's a 365-day-a-year job. It used to be, and I love these two, by the way, it used to be, you know, you loaded up and you had your suitcase with the cool banners, you know, and, and your signs and all this kind of stuff. And you went to the job fairs, right? Like the University of Wyoming job fair was one of my favorites. And they would open the doors when the kids came running in to get signed up for, for their, their interviews. And there would be hundreds of them. That's just not happening anymore. So, Todd, are you still going to job fairs or it, what? what's the approach now? And feel free to give away some of your secrets, right? I mean, <laughs> people are leaning in right now, like, Todd, tell me how to make this happen because I don't have 45 people applying for an opening like, like Dominic does. That's why I'm coming to you. We, we, we still have job fairs. And I think, I think traditionally the job fair will always uh, be there. Um, I do think that... Um, for success in Texas, it will be going out and recruiting throughout other states of the country. And I do think if, if New York and New Jersey and Long Island has a surplus, and I think that our districts or districts will need to go tap into that. Um, what I have done is twofold. Uh, high school principal, so every time I have an opportunity to talk to students, I talk to them about one day coming back home to Churchill High School and being a teacher. So I'm trying to plant that seed in their head any opportunity I can. In fact, just Friday, I spoke to a group of wrestlers and junior ROTC kids. And I said, every one of you has the ability to be a teacher. Every one of you has had a great experience here at Churchill. Four years from now, if you choose to be a teacher, I will hire you. I will bring you home. You can work with the, the teachers right now that you love, and you can make a difference here. So I think uh, our job is planting that seed in people to, to, to encourage them to do it. Second of all, I think that the future of our teacher is going to be alternative certified. 
you know, gone are the days of, like you mentioned, Darren, of people uh, at UNLV of going the traditional route in student teaching. I think our, we're going to see people that go into, I'll just use for lack of a better word, to dot com business and go work and they work remote and they have these great jobs. And then all of a sudden that bubble breaks and they may not have a job, but they have experience working in business or, or uh, something and they want to come back. And I think that's where I am starting to capitalize on. So people that are out there in those jobs to say to them, hey, if you're ever interested in teaching, come on back. And I'll add another thing that I think is the secret, like the, you know, what we have. Every new teacher that we get on campus, we can't afford to lose. We have to view those teachers as the most irreplaceable teachers on our campus. We have to meet with them, assist them, help them grow, give them feedback, build them up, anything that we can do to keep them. Because if every year we hire 30 teachers and every year it just keeps turning over and over again, we'll never win. But if we can keep the new teachers every single year and build upon that, then I think we can turn the tide. So I think it's going to be looking all over the country for, for folks to be able to uh, be hired. I think it's going to be looking at alternative certified candidates. In fact, I know Dom sends out newsletters. I send out newsletters. In that newsletter this year, throughout many times throughout the year, I have said, parents, if you want to schedule just like your child's schedule, or if you're tired of working in a cubicle um, and you want to teach, Let's talk. I can talk to you about alternative certification programs to be able to go from there. And then I think once we get the teachers on the ground, we have to love on them and keep them so that they don't leave. Because if they keep leaving, we're in some trouble. Well, that's that's 100% the truth, right? I mean, you know, for, forever, if, if you don't like the, the teachers in front of you, you've always had two choices. Go get other ones or coach them up. The, that first option to go get other ones, they're, they're just not there. You've got to work hard to coach them up and love them up and uh, help them really feel like they are part of part of your campus. I, I want to run with something that you talked about a little bit there, though. Uh, the, the alternative certification piece was uh, for quite some time something that you would see, particularly in the career and technical education wing of your building. You know, maybe you get somebody who comes in and they teach. Uh, intro to construction because they, you know, they used to build houses for a living or, you know, you had somebody who was, you know, doing architectural drawing or, you know, whatever, right? Culinary arts. Um, best culinary arts teacher I ever worked with had been a chef in, uh, in Laughlin, Nevada and uh, came on board and taught culinary at Kingman High School. He was amazing. Chef Call, incredible guy. Um, man, we ate great too. Man, did we eat great as a staff. But uh, but here's my point. It's not just current technical education anymore. Um, I, I think you guys know this. I think the listeners know this. I'm teaching uh, now as an adjunct faculty member at Fort Hayes State University. And the course that I'm teaching right now, I have 17 um, graduate level students uh, taking advanced classroom management, which I think it's only called advanced because it's a graduate level course, but these are all new to the profession, people taking a graduate level course. Uh, several of them are already in the classroom, uh, teaching kindergarten, teaching third grade. Uh, I've got a couple teaching at the high school level. Um, and it's not just, you know, I'm going to go teach auto mechanics. It's, you know, I want to be an English teacher. I want to be a science teacher. I, you know, whatever it, it might be. It's interesting to me that that alternative certification route has become such a big, big avenue for teachers, not just in the CTE way. Is that is that what you're seeing? Both of you guys, are you seeing alternative certifications for uh, for our more core level courses? Uh, I'm not actually, no, no, no. Like for me, it's still very much like we, I don't know. It's weird because, I, okay, so I've been waiting for this shortage that's happening everywhere else to kind of hit where I am and it, and it hasn't, you know, and, and I know, I mean, I guess we are lucky or I guess I am lucky because I do have multiple candidates you know, that I could choose from, but I know I haven't seen that. What I have seen though, is recently the state is talking about, there was an article that was published, um, let me say a couple of weeks ago, but the state is talking about changing the requirements for teacher certification altogether, because I think they're anticipating the shortage hitting. And one of the requirements that they're talking about is like eliminating the need for a master's degree. Uh, which in New York, in order to get permanently certified or professionally certified, you have to have that master's degree. 
So I think they're taking proactive steps. Maybe that's something that'll happen, but no, I haven't seen it. It's very, I'm still very much in this like, all right, I have 500 applicants and I need one. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that, that's kind of where I am. I, I don't know. Yeah. Don't don't turn off the podcast, folks, because you're angry at Dom. Please don't do that. That's that's not fair. Um, you know, right, I would tell you, right? Yeah. Well, I would tell you, you know, the state of Arizona when I first started teaching in 1995, same requirement. You had to have a master's degree within, I think it was five years, and within two years of me being there, they pulled the plug on that because Arizona was already starting to find gaps in being able to hire teachers. And I mean, guys, that was. It was a long time. I was almost 30 years ago. So it's interesting that New York still has that requirement, but they're moving away from it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Todd. Te Texas does not have that requirement. You do not need a master's. A lot of people do have their master's, but you don't need that. But uh, Darren, to your point, um, yes, we are seeing um, math teachers, English teachers, uh, core content area teachers that are alternative certified. And, and, and as I say that, that's not a bad thing. They bring such great life experiences with them. Sometimes they traditionally might be a little older than a 22 or 23 year old first year teacher. So with the right support and the right coaching and the right feedback, you know, they have been very, very successful in what we, what, you know, what part of our mission and our goal to be a, a great school, but gone are the days of, of looking at an alternative certified candidate and looking down on them. Like now it's just like any other candidate that puts their name in it. Can they do the job? Do they love kids? And let's go. Well, and I think on top of that, too, I like how you touched on, you know, with the right with the right support and the right coaching. That's really and and I'm, I'm just really curious to hear this from from the two of you guys in the, you know, in the trenches every single day as the building level principles. I bang the drum all the time about the instructional leadership responsibilities of the building principle. Right. Like I, I was just speaking at this conference, my leaning into school leadership piece, a big chunk of what I talk about is how you carve out that time, how you don't spend only 16 percent of your time as an elementary principal or 10 percent of your time as a high school principal. That's what the research shows on instructional leadership, that you actually go and do more of that work and that coaching and supporting those alternative certified staff, just, just like any of your brand new staff, it's a good way to keep them there, right? So they don't feel beat down. So they don't feel like they don't know what they're doing. I mean, it, alternative certification, so often what we find is a gap in that, that pedagogy that they learn in that undergraduate program. But what we learn in our undergraduate programs, we don't carry that, that expertise from the field like you talked about todd in so i mean it's kind of a given to you know it's given trade but it's really all about really providing that coaching and support and pushing on them right i, I mean i mean just i mean what you say i mean what you say is so true because let, let's be honest let's just let's let's throw it out there everyone who's listening knows what you learn in your undergraduate or graduate coursework to be a teacher or an administrator means nothing <laughs> right like let's let's throw it out there i mean let's be but, but it's true right like i i could if i go back to the days of my undergraduate and and again i loved where i went to school shout out to dowling college they were fantastic and amazing but you know everything i learned there and then i went into my first year it was like wait it was completely opposite you know and i think i think todd had said it before you know one of the things Aside from coaching, because yes, we should be spending more time in our classrooms, coaching our staff, meeting with them, giving them examples, you know, modeling, mentoring, but a, a love of kids. I, I think that's the, I think Todd, you had said that, like, if you have a love of kids, no matter what age, you know, whether they're the, the babies of the elementary school of me or the, the high school babies, because technically there's, they still are, if you really think about it, right? I mean, if you love kids and, and, and you're ready to spend your days in and out with them, everything else will come, you know, and, and I guess that's our job to make sure that everything else does come. That's our job to spend more than six. It's crazy to think that the percentage is 16% for elementary school. You know, I mean, like, yes. And, and, and that's what you have to, as a leader, no matter what candidate you're getting, you have to be able to make that commitment. But the people that are taking the jobs need to have that love of children because if they don't have that love of children then 
we we're just going to be spinning our wheels making that commitment to coach them and mentor them i think one of the the key things this year with the number of large number of uh, new teachers that we have on campus is written feedback every single time i'm in their class and and darren to your point every monday i block off to be in classrooms so let's say 20 percent there that i'm able to be in a classroom throughout the week and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I try to get out and about into classrooms also. But every time, every single time, it's an index card or a sticky note about something that I saw that they did really well and a thought for them to kind of think about. And if we don't provide that for them, just think about like maybe when you started teaching uh, Dom or Darren, I, 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 you know, you went months before you saw an administrator that came into your room. You could have been the greatest or the worst and nobody had any idea. And as long as you kept the kids in your classroom and you didn't have discipline referrals, and you didn't have parents complaining and your grade book was updated, they might have thought you were a great teacher when you were doing, you know, not not great work. Yeah. And so it is our job to be in those classrooms every single day. I also think one of the things that I started this year, I send an email to my new teachers only every single Monday morning. And every morning I try to pick them up. I try to give them a little thing to think about. I try to give them a nugget. Um, this the one that I just wrote this morning, the delay delivery till tomorrow, is when they drive off campus on Friday to look in the rearview mirror and be proud of them for making it to spring break. So I try to motivate, I try to build up, I try to highlight and showcase the different new teachers that are there. And I think that's been a real part of bringing together the new teachers into a cohort. And then the other day, I'll just share on this, this is one of those things where I feel like it's working. Two new teachers, I saw them at lunch. I said, hi guys, where are you going? Oh, we're going for a walk. It's such a beautiful day. And it was two new teachers that were in the same department that were going from there. Probably didn't talk anything about content, but it was to, they built a friendship and a connection at school that makes them enjoy what they're doing. And so I walked away feeling like a proud papa that we had brought these people on board, that they had made a friendship and that they were going uh, to take a walk during their conference period. So I thought that was pretty cool. That, that's so awesome. And, and I think too, like, you know, something so simple that I've done over the last, and again, uh, the perspective, right? Todd, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, right? So as far as newer teachers are concerned, I've only really had two years worth of experience with new teachers. Um, when I first became an AP, it was a very seasoned staff. And then as I became the principal in my last school, we did a, a hiring. But one of the things that it's so simple and true, but it's just being honest. Like I, I talk about it in my book that I promise Darren will come out one of these days, but in the, in the first chapter, you're laughing, but it's true, right? In the first chapter or so, when I talk about my story, like my first year was a disaster. <laughs> like, like, it, like to the point where I was like, I'm going to go back and get an MBA and do something completely different. And I'm glad I didn't because I love what I do. But it's that honesty of like, when I see my new teachers and they have a tough day at the end of the day. I tell them it's okay. Like it's okay that this year sucks. We'll get through it. Like you're gonna have your good days, you're gonna have your bad days. But like you, everyone has a year one, and it's okay to to explain that. You know, you're not gonna be perfect. And and I feel like between the coaching, between the helping, and that honesty of like them saying like, wow, even my principal said like it's tough and like it's not gonna be perfect. Like it relaxes them if that makes any sense. Well, it does. It does. And, you know, I, I know you guys have heard me say it numerous times. I probably said it on the podcast numerous times. My favorite quote by Rory Vaden, we are uniquely positioned to help the person that we once were. And, you know, when 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 you talk with your staff, when you're that honest and that vulnerable and that real with your staff and just say, you think this is bad. Let me tell you about my first year, you know, it does. It, it brings that blood pressure down a little bit. It allows them to just take a deep breath. And also it allows them to know that you see them as a human being, not just as the teacher in room 204. Right. So um, I, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways, folks, from from this particular episode. When we talk about all of these processes that that come together in putting your team together, it's don't forget that they're human beings. Don't forget that um, you want to build a culture. You want to build uh, an environment where everybody feels like they're part of something special. And I know both of you guys, um, and, and it's in both of your books and both of your books will be out. 
you know, it's it, Todd's is going to beat Dom's to market. I, I already know that, but um, yeah, <laughs> mostly because his is done and turned in. There's there's certainly <laughs> that. That's that's a part of it. But um, but really, I mean, you guys are about building culture. You know, that's that's what I'm about too. I mean, you know, of my six things that I think truly matter in school leadership, number one is building and maintaining positive culture and climate, and number two is loving and supporting every single one of the adults that work on our campus. So let's let's maybe, you know, try to move this towards a little bit of conclusion on on our March Madness topic of getting the right pieces in place and keeping them there. Um, you guys have talked a lot about culture. You've talked a lot about strategy. Um, you know, to me, it was always about how do I find that that one piece right you know you, you look at uh, when we're when we're recording this um the it, it's interesting the nfl season really never ends right so as we're recording this and this will drop right after the tampering period funny that we talked about tampering uh the legal tampering period in nfl free agency will be open and teams are shopping for that one player that's going to put them over the edge right that, that one player that will allow them to overtake the Chiefs had become that next that next big team, or or teams like my team, or honestly, Todd, sorry, your Giants, um, they're looking for more than one piece, right? You know, our schools are that way too. There are some schools that are looking for multiple pieces, and they're trying to figure out how do I get how do I get the best value for you know for for what I can go after, you know, where you know Dom is, you know, he's got five hundred free agents, and he's just trying to find that that one guy, right? So, or that one gal, whatever it might be. What, what are some things as you guys think about that? As you look at the, the construction of your team right now, where, where do you go? Every March I show up the, the same picture and it's a picture of a basketball player from the university of Michigan. And um, he must've just made a shot or made a big play and he turns to his bench and the excitement from everybody on the bench and the people behind him is unbelievable. And I share that photo with my staff every year to talk about as we finish and as we talk about March Madness and as we talk about the craziness of testing season, how it takes a complete team to finish the year. And if you notice the people on the bench, I equate the people on the bench, the ones that are not teaching the uh, state, state uh, assessments or the standardized tests that we have or these may be the para paraprofessionals, uh, or these may be the first year teacher. These are the people that are just supporting the cause. And then we talk about how excited everybody is for the success of somebody else. And we really talk about how to come together as a great team, to come together as a great school, we have to band together and we have to cheer each other on and we have to be happy when others get success, even if we're not a part of that success. And it's always been one of these real motivational type things that I love to share because I think it taps into everybody's kind of spirit to say, I may be teaching a CTE course uh, and I know a teacher has a math algebra one state assessment. What can I do to help? How can I help out? Can I encourage a student in my class to go to tutoring? Can I ask a kid how they're doing in algebra? Can I look grades up? And we just talk about that. I think it does great wonders for the people on the court that are in the uh, state assessment ring, but it also brings people together to say, holy cow, this is a lot of pressure and stress on you. Congratulations, you did a great job. So I think as we really talk about March Madness and that sports analogies, I think that these these just images of um, Shamadad or schools uh, that, that never ever beat North Carolina, rise up and beat Duke or North Carolina, give great hopes that any school that's committed to a vision and any school that comes together as a team has a chance to be successful if they believe in themselves, they put great structures in place and they continue to work hard. So March Madness is a great motivator when it comes to looking at standardized testing and how we can be successful. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it any better, you know, and I always around this time of year, I've always done a bit of a, a reset and um, a reminder of all of the successes that we've done from the beginning of the school year till now, you know, whether it be 
on track to accomplishing our goals, um, on track to all of the success that we've had with our students so far. You know, now's the time you look at like mid-year assessments on kids, ones that you've had like concerns with and you, you know, you see the progress and the gains and, you know, just kind of, you know, end that year or keep that year going with the same enthusiasm that we had in September. You know, we all opened up our schools with such high energy enthusiasm, right? The big staff conferences in the beginning of the year. Uh, try, try and do one now, you know, leading into the March one. Uh, we're lucky enough. We have another superintendent's conference day happening at the end of the month uh, where we're you know, going to be just, again, taking that time to have that same September motivation, you know, just getting those, getting the staff, getting the teachers, getting the kids ready to go into the second half of the year. Uh, and uh, just I'm really excited for that. I'm really excited to just uh, keep the fire burning. That's kind of where we are. So. I love that. I love that from both you guys. I think that's I think that's fantastic. And, you know, definitely, definitely a great analogy, you know, uh, Todd, with uh, with the Michigan player and, and everybody on the bench cheering them on and and how, you know, every school, every school has an opportunity to be great. Um, you've you've got to define it. You got to be clear what it is. You mentioned that vision. Um, folks, I say it all the time, but if you can get clear about what you're looking for and you can be intentional about the work that you want to do, and you heard it from both, from both Dom and Todd today, um, it's really clear what they care about. It's really clear what they're looking for. And they're being really intentional with their time, their efforts, their words, their communication to help draw that out of everybody. And in their schools, there's no question. And this can happen in your school too. Um, when that vision is clear, when everybody knows what really it's all about, man, incredible things can happen, right? Because everybody starts to take ownership and they start to believe in that vision and they know what their portion is and why when we see that success, I'm going to jump up and down and cheer us on whether I'm on the bench, whether I'm the water boy or I'm the person who just hit the shot. It doesn't matter. We're all in this together. Uh, man, awesome episode today, guys. This was just so much fun. Um, really, really enjoy this collaboration with the two of you. Uh, I'm going to say this next week or next month in April, uh, Dominic, we are coming to you. We want to know about that process. I, I, we both talked about vision, Todd and I, we've talked about vision in this episode. You've been working on that with your staff. And I think in April, it would be a great time to hear a little bit of an update of where you are in that process. You got it. I'm, I'm excited to share. Uh, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Final thoughts. Uh, Dom, I'll go to you first. No, I just think, again, I think, you know, March Madness, I think, is the perfect way to describe everything that we talked about today. Because just like the uh, NCAA, we're talking about enthusiasm. We're talking about uh, fun. We're talking about rebuilding uh, everything. So <clears throat> just wishing everybody a, a, a good, crazy month of March. I would say shout out to uh, our families. A lot of times as uh, building administrators, our families take a back seat to our job and, and that's not right. And so shout out to uh, spouses and children for um, putting up with our jobs. I'd also say shout out to our leadership teams. Uh, I got a great leadership team that's got my back that are great people that do everything we need to do for a campus. And so sometimes those folks get uh, forgotten. Lastly, we're in the, uh, I can't end any episode without talking about advocacy. Um, we're in early primary seasons. We got elections coming up. It is very important that we're knowledgeable about who our candidates are and where they stand on issues that are important to us. And so make sure that you're getting out there and vote, uh, exercising your right, or we don't have a right to complain. And we got to get out there and get after that. So uh, Dom and Darren, I appreciate it. I look forward to this every month. Um, you guys have become more yeah, than just... Yeah. Uh, people out there on the internet and, and people that I follow, you become friends and brothers. And I truly appreciate that guy. So thank you so much. Right on. Absolutely. Yeah. Now this, uh, as always, again, you know, a fantastic episode, a lot of fun sitting down and talking with you guys, folks. Thank you so much for joining us here on leaning into leadership, get out there and have a road to awesome week. Thank you for listening to the leaning into leadership podcast brought to you by road to awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.